What up? I am at the Tucson Festival of Books. I'm about to head out to check in for the day and get my volunteer shirt. In the meantime, I'm repping Frankenstein, but I am so pumped, but I'm also starving and I have approximately an hour until I have to sit in my first panel, which is Hafsa Faisal and some other people. Uh, but I really want to see Hafsa Faisal. So that's what I'm doing, but I, I want to try and get some food first and um, I do have to check in. <laughs> I'm going to get my shirt. Otherwise, they're going to think I'm not coming to my shift, which is at one o'clock, but I have to be there at 1230. Anyway, you don't care. I'm going to take you to the Festival of Books. Let's go. who look down on these people and so Arthi, the owner of the tea room, was more like, I don't know if I want to let them get off, get, get away with all of this. And so my sisters and I were just sitting down and chatting about it. So I was like, I need this to be a front for something else. And then as a joke, I was like, what if in these same teacups they serve blood? But we need someone to drink that blood, right? And so that's why vampires came into play. Okay, so y'all remember Panicula? Y'all remember those books? Yeah. Yes. I was obsessed with Panicula back in the day. I love those books. To this day, I'm convinced he was a vampire. I don't know if they ever confirmed or denied if it was like he was a vampire or like the other animals were paranoid. But I think he was a vampire rabbit. I believe that with my whole heart. Aww. I love that series. And then I will admit this back when Twilight first came out, I was I was like a seventh grade. I was like, that was my time. Oh, so exactly. I mean, I know it's got problems, but exactly. I like to die. Exactly. <laughs> it's like you have to have your problematic thing, and mine was of course in Twilight. Um and so I was very deep in that, but I was just like Were you team Edward? I was not team Edward though, because I was like I liked the lore of the vampires more than the lore of the werewolves, but like I thought Edward was creepy. But <laughs> I was obsessed with the lore, like I just the way she built it and like what these monsters represented and that's just something that stuck with me. And so when I kinda of started working with Sarah, well, originally she was a treasure hunter, and then my agent at the time was like, scrap that. I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> But um, I was like, okay, I know I want to do something with like a monster, a fantasy, and I want to do something for my culture. And the Ajaya was something I actually researched for my YA series, but I could never fit them into that series. And I was like, hang on, we have this really cool vampire like in Ghana that's like not seen in the West a lot. And I was like, let me bring that forward. And then that really started the deep dive into like that creature and how it works. What do you think it is about that childhood love? Um, that is that like we kind of hold, hold on to either as a fantasy or that like heart thing we just can't let go of and and what about that did you want to pull into your books um we'll start with rachel my book is definitely a second chance but i don't always think of it in the same like a lot of times second chances it's they broke up a few years ago or they were together into adulthood. Um, and these two had like a fling at summer camp when they were 13, but they were best friends at summer camp before that. And what was nice about that is it allows there to be this sort of tension, like they never resolved why they had stopped being friends. And you know, Daniel thinks it's one thing and, and for Leah it was actually something completely different and that's 
part of why the resolution didn't happen and why the resolution doesn't happen immediately because he sort of doesn't apologize for the right thing. He doesn't really know what he has done that, that hurt her. Um, and it allows that this relationship in the present to be kind of totally new. I'm not the same person I was at 13. They're not the same people they were at 13. So it's not necessarily totally a continuation of the previous relationship, but they get to come back to each other for the same very like that seed of, of how they were friends first. And um, they went to a summer camp together that was a Jewish summer camp. And in the US, Jews are predominantly Ashkenazi, which is descended from Eastern Europe. Um, and so most of those people are still white assimilated. Um, and they would have been the only two or two of the only people of color in their age group. Um, and that was a really big like bond for them. And even though you know that friendship is kind of in, in the past, in adulthood, they get to do that for each other again when they go to a synagogue together on Yom Kippur, which is one of the high holidays. Um, so it allows you to have this kind of like familiarity and intention, um, but it's also, something I was going for just based on when they kind of had their previous thing. It's not that like nobody has ever been the right person for them since. Um, it's more that like they were able to come together for a seed of the sameness they saw in one another when they were children. And then as a, again, as adults, when they're like ready to actually start healing enough to be with another person, they still have that same seed. And so it's kind of like right person, right time, twice in their lives. I think, um, and again, like those of you who are from uh, not just, just this town, but any town that's small enough where you sort of know the same people all your lives, there's something that's really extraordinary about having friendships where people have known you since you were little and still know you as an adult. There is a way in which, you know, the friends, I'm, I'm going out with all the girls I've known since third grade um, while I'm here, and we, there is a way in which those people sort of have been there for every major thing that's ever happened to you in your whole life. So when you are with them, you don't have to explain any backstory to them about how you became who you are because they sort of witnessed all of it. I'm always, I think I always tend to be drawn to romance novels about that because there is, um, there's an ease there, but there's also a tension. Hannah and Levi specifically each think the other one should know them without having to actually communicate out loud mm -hmm. about it because it's like, you know me, you've known me all our lives, we've been friends all our lives, why don't you understand where I'm coming from on this? And so they do a lot of miscommunicating based on sort of like being sad that the other person doesn't know them better somehow. So there's a lot of, <clears throat> I think, sort of rich ability to say, well, these two people should know each other better than anyone has ever known anybody else, but they still can't talk to each other. Um, because along the way, they have a lot of baggage, right? They have more baggage than anyone else of each other. And they also have like old dynamics. You know, what Rachel was talking about is so true. Like when you, when you don't see someone for a long time, you get to grow into a new person. But they have grown together, and so they get stuck in these old dynamics. Mm -hmm. And with Second Chance, you know, they, they went and didn't speak to each other for four years and had like a complete break where they were like, we're done, we're done forever, I never want to speak to you again, I never want to see you again. And so they were able to really grow into new people in a way that was much healthier than if they stayed together. And so it allowed them to be someone else other than the person they'd always been. And I was just really interested in that kind of tension between I need you, you're the person who knows me best, and also I need to be someone without you. So, I don't know. Um, I love the, I love new friends, and I love the um, comfort and know, being known of someone who's always known you. So um, I just wanted to play with what, what it looks like when someone has always known you and doesn't know you at all. Yeah, uh, similarly to what Helena said, uh, I'm really drawn to uh, the comfort and the like, what happens when you have when you've known someone all of your life. So in my book, uh, Mary and Leo are childhood friends um, who turn to, you know, lovers uh, when they are like teenage, and they get married very young. They get married at 18, even though everyone tells them not to do that. 
Um, and uh, very quickly, within a couple of years, the marriage falls apart, largely because of like uh, expectations, <laughs> expectations that Leo has about who he should be as a husband, uh, and why he cannot fulfill these things because they are very poor. For him, the best course of action, the only course of action that he thinks he can take is like a very foolish 21-year-old man is to just leave, uh, just leave her alone. Uh, they do not divorce, but uh, when they return to each other, I think they have both been in more of a suspended state than a state of like healing in many ways. Uh, I think the book, I'm attempting to have them heal this wound that they have about each other together. I think that like, it, it was always really, so Second tr Chance is actually probably one of my least favorite tropes. And I did it uh, largely, be or it was rather. <laughs> I did it because I wanted to see if I could do it and if I could make myself like it. And I did, <laughs> and I gained a, a great appreciation for what it is to have a comfort and to know someone and then to learn them again uh, and again and again. Uh, and even when that like, that comfort is still there. Even you can still have like the reticence of like keeping parts of yourself from someone that you, you know, have always known. Like the same way you can have it with someone you've met just yesterday. Um, and so yeah, I think that like I think the through line is that it it creates a certain like it's an uneasy comfort, but it is a comfort. It's just like undeniable. That I love that you all touched on that idea. <laughs> Except it was not about werewolves. I wanted to write a book that was like 
Romeo and Juliet, about warring families coming together and the children that grow up around them and whatnot. I wrote that book, like 30,000 words of that book. And then my brain said, what if they were werewolves? <laughs> Keep in mind, this is not a fantasy. It was just contemporary drama. And I was like, that's stupid. Why would I do that? My brain was like, no, but for real. <laughs> very serious in my literature is very literary. <laughs> and then my brain was like, okay, well, cool, werewolves. So I started rewrite, I rewrote from the very beginning, I kind of scrapped what I had, and I started reading about wolf behavior, wolf culture, werewolf lore, and I was like, this is so dumb, I can't wait. <laughs> and then I decided at some point um, to make this book uh, the series, I guess I should say, people here can probably attest to it, that um, to be as emotionally devastating as possible, <laughs> while also making you smile, and then laugh, and then cry in the next paragraph, and then curse my name. And if you had a voodoo doll, you'd probably try to stab it, and pretending it's me because of the things I did. But here's what I would like to say. These are very good books. I enjoyed writing them, I love them. The fact that I get to be able to talk to you about the Green Creek series, when this series came out, it, the first book came out in 2016 with a small independent publisher released in paperback, released in an uh, uh, ebook. And then my publisher that I signed up with, Tor, was like, We like gay werewolves. And I said, Oh my God, I know some. <laughs> and then they published them. They published, they're publishing this entire series that has meant so much to so many readers. The fact that I get to emotionally traumatize a new wave of readers is just <laughs> icing on the cake. And the sadism runs deep. It does. It absolutely does. <laughs> like people, you know, I've I've talked to authors before. Like I cried when I got to this book when I was writing because I knew something sad was going to happen. It was going to affect the reader. I cackle. I laugh. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, this is going to make people sad. Why am I doing this? <laughs> and I do it anyways. But here's I, these books are about family, about love, about loyalty, about betrayal, about hope. Um, but basically, they continue my message of showing that fam families are just as important as families related by blood. In case you guys hear, you probably hear about it all the time now. Found family, found family this, found family that, found family tropes being used left and right. Here's the thing. Found family comes from a very real place for queer people. The queer community, we don't often get to have the families of our own. The families that, you know, brought us into the world. I don't. So what do I do? My entire family, aside from my sister and my brother, are made up of people who are not related to me, who I love and would go to bath with me any day of the week knowing I would do the same for them. That's what these books are about. And they're also kind of sexy, which is weird. <laughs> because if you've read The House and it's really insane, you're like, oh, I can't wait for TJ to write something nice and happy again. And then there's, you know, anal sex. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm sorry. So, anyways, that's my books. Thank you. Hello. Pippin. Come on, can you be good? I have things to show you. I um went a little overboard. Oh, just just a little. I am so tired. I'm very sore. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I realized I forgot to put on sunscreen on my arms, but I think I'm okay. But um, I put it on my face, so we're good. But I'm full of sugar and also other things that I ate that I shouldn't have eaten, like you guys saw my gelato earlier. That not supposed to have that but I couldn't help myself because it is espresso chip gelato and I wanted it and it was very hot and the line for the pork buns was too long. Let's 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 look at the books I got. So I'm going to show you the books I got and then the books that I already owned that I just got signed. So I didn't buy all of these today. I mean I bought a lot of books today but I didn't buy all of them. I knew this was going to happen whenever I see a panel that I, I really like the author or they make me laugh or they make their book sound really awesome. I get talked into it and that has happened two or three times today and I anticipate it happening tomorrow as well. So the first instance of that, actually let's let's go in order. I should have put these in order. Take my post it off because I got it signed. So the first one is an, an author that I'd, I'd heard of her book. She she debuted with a YA fantasy, A Song of Wraiths and Ruin I think is the name, Roseanne A. Brown. And she was hilarious, and I really liked her, but she is part of the Rick Riordan Presents series now, and she has written a story about a 12-year-old vampire hunter from Ghana. She just made it sound really interesting, so it's 
Sarwa Bot Bot she said it differently. Sarwa Botangs. I'm gonna have to learn how to pronounce it. Guide to Vampire Hunting. And this is about uh Ghanaian vampires. Ghanaian she said it and I said I was gonna remember how to say it, but I can't remember how to say it. Vampires from Ghana, which are different from Western vampires. And basically she said they turn into fireflies and they get inside of a human body and possess them. And the person is a vampire then until they're dispossessed of the, the firefly creature. It's about a 12 year old girl who's raised to be a vampire hunter, but then her parents are like, whoa, this is dangerous. Why did we do this? And they send her away to Maryland from Ghana and she goes to middle school for the first time. And the author was like, basically I pitched this as what if a vampire hunter child went to middle school and had to use her vampire hunter skills to survive middle school? <laughs> it sounded great. So I don't know what I'm going to get to it. I don't read middle, middle grade very often, but it just, it just sounded too delightful to pass up. And I got a free bookmark and she signed it to me to Ashley Stakes Up, Roseanne Brown. She goes by Rosie, I guess. So you're in the know now. So that's the first book I got. Then I did buy this earlier in the week with the express purpose of getting it signed by this author at the festival. So I'm counting it. And that's A Tempest of Tea by Hafsa Faisal. So she was delightful and she really impressed me. So I'm really glad that I bought this and it just sounds fun. It's a Victorian-esque fantasy with this woman who owns a tea house and it's going to involve heists and there's a little element of romance, and I, I don't want to know too much going in, but it just it just sounded fun, and I love this cover. So she signed it to me. Ashley, it's Tea Time Scoundrels, Hafsa Faisal. I'm really excited about this one. I don't need this post-it. Wait, hold on. Oh, and it's got this. Oh, you guys, it hurts. So I got a bookmark. And I always love a bookmark. It's got the book on the back. And then on the front it says, Why Save the World When You Can Have Tea? And then I got a pin. Look at it. It's a pin. It's so pretty. It says, The Streets of White Roaring Grew Fangs at Night. So I'm going to put this straight on my pin banner. Okay, and then next up, I had a romance panel. And this is one of the authors that talked me into her books. And then I also logged on and I saw that Rochelle, hi Rochelle, had rated this five stars and said she freaking loved it. So I, I figured I had to buy it, even though I really don't like the cover and I could have paid less for it or got it from the library. I just, I wanted to support the author and I can buy books today and tomorrow. So I just, I'm, you know, I, I did it okay. That is Play to Win by Jody Slaughter. This is a book about a couple who meet and fall in love when they're very young and they get married way too young, even though everyone tells them not to and the marriage blows up and he leaves because he's immature and she's immature. But she wins the lottery eight years later, and they're still married, so there's legal ramifications. So she makes an awkward phone call to him, like, we need to settle this, please come here. And he's, he doesn't know that she won the lottery, so he just comes to town like, we're going to get back together, she wants me back. Anyway, I think it's going to be fun. I don't often go for second chance romances, but she talked about it. She said that second chance romances aren't her favorite either, which I thought was interesting, but she wanted to try writing one to see if she could make herself like it. And... She said it worked like gangbusters. She didn't say that. I don't remember exactly what she said. I, I'm excited to read it, so. And then that same panel was Helena Greer. And I got her new book signed, For Never and Always, which is a romance between this character I don't know yet because I've read the first book and um, this bisexual dude who is a little bit gender non-conforming. And the first book in the series I already own, which is Season of Love. So I got that signed. And it says, welcome to Kerrigan's. Ashley, thank you for your help. Helena Greer. Now let's talk about this book, which I spilled water on. And it, the spine, all of this was wet all day long. <laughs> I think it's drying okay, but you can see it like it got damaged. And I don't know if you can see that it's wrinkled now. I'm very upset about it because this was brand new. The author kind of made fun of me for <laughs> being precious about it. But I'm like, what are you going to do, man? And then what does this one say? I didn't even look. Oh, it just says Ashley, and then she signed it. So, did I look at this one? I think I did, or did I not? No, I didn't. So, Jody says, to Ashley, thank you for being a stellar guide. <laughs> like, guys, you don't have to personalize it, but it's cute. Okay, so that was my first panel this morning, and then I wandered around for a while, and I met up with Jesse, and we got kettle corn and tea from this, like, tea house place that had a booth there, and I don't even remember what I did. <laughs> 
So then we went, oh, and then we went to the UA Bookstore tent, which has every book from every presenting author at the festival. So we just literally did like circled the whole place and I pulled out every book I could find from authors that I was seeing that day and tomorrow. So hopefully I don't have to waste time buying books tomorrow. If I buy one, it'll just be like from a used bookstore tent or something, not because I'm going to see an author and want to want to get a book signed. So then I went and I, my, my schedule was really f up. <laughs> oh no, my bookmark about the metric system got a little foobled. Um, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to keep that. So then I went and I didn't end up going to the panel that I wanted to go to, which had Seth Dickinson, Cory Doctorow, and David Slayton on it. So I just decided to get in line for them because my schedule was so tight. There was a four o'clock panel that I wanted to go to, which I wanted to tell you about later, but I knew that if I went to the Seth Dickinson panel and I went up with everyone else and then went down to the signing line and then got in line, it would be cutting it too close. So I just got in line and waited and I didn't end up going to their panel, which is sad. I wanted to see Seth Dickinson in particular talk because I've seen David Slayton before and I've read a book by Cory Doctorow, but I'm not like super in love with that dude or whatever. The book was fine. I don't remember the name of it. It was a YA dystopia about San Francisco and hacking or something like that. Whatever. <laughs> if I care enough, I'll put the name down here when I edit. But anyway, so I just got a couple. I got my copy of the Trader Baru Cormorant signed, which is damaged. And I'm, I'm upset about it. Doesn't even, I think maybe if I just glued it down, it would be okay. I mean, it's never going to be perfect, but it's in kind of <laughs> bad shape. And then he signed this one to me. Where's the signature? Oh, there it is. To Ashley, consider your loyalties. And then he dated it. Today's date. So that's that one. And then I, well, I, I bought his copy of his new book, which I DNF'd this in January. But hear me out here. The reason I DNF'd it was not because I was not liking it or that it wasn't good because I was liking it and it was good, but it was giving me existential thoughts and I just, I have to be in the right mood if we're gonna be talking about that kind of stuff. It was giving me very dark thoughts and anxiety. So I had to stop reading it, which I, I mean, this book took me a month and a half, two months to read. The sequel took me like six months to read. I haven't even tried to read book three yet. Luckily book four isn't out. So I should have known that his writing style like just doesn't gel with a fast reading speed for me. I don't know why. All that to say is I bought Exordia <laughs> and uh, this is a sci-fi space opera. It's very weird. I don't even know how to describe it. It's been too long <laughs> since I read the first. I think I got like 12% in, 13% in to the audiobook. It's really long. It doesn't look that long, but these are Bible, like Bible pages. It's actually quite long. It's like 600 pages. Yeah. So flimsy. I don't like flimsy books. I wish they, I would, I would take a thick book over a book with really super thin pages, but that's just me. This one is hilarious for Ashley Hiss. <laughs> if you've read the book, you know why. And then I did end up buying David Slayton's first book, which he wasn't there to promote this one, but this is the one I'm, I've got on my TBR, which is White Trash Warlock. It's an urban fantasy. He's got another book out right now that he's promoting, but I don't remember the name of it, but he came to the festival two years ago and I wanted to buy this then, but just due to timing, they were sold out of these when I went to go buy one. It was the very last day of the festival, the last signing of the festival, and I just, I didn't get one. So I finally bought it and I don't know when I'm going to get to it, but I had to leave the signing early after I got, which I was also really surprised. His line was much longer than Seth Dickinson's line which surprised me. I don't know why. But I had to leave David Slayton's line to go to my next panel at 4 p.m. because I was getting texts from my friend saying, hey, it's really, really crowded. It's standing room only. Basically, we've got a seat for you, but you need to get here soon. So I left the line and I didn't get it signed. So it's fine though. It's fine. Uh, signatures aren't the most important thing. Last panel I went to was really fun. It was TJ Klune, Isabel Cañas, and Tracy Wolf, who writes vampire, well, her big series right now is vampire stuff, bio vampire stuff that I'm not interested in at all, but it's pretty popular, I think. And she was fine, but Isabel and TJ were very amusing. And I'm sure that I just showed you some footage. I, 
<laughs> I got TJ's best story on camera. So you're welcome. TJ's line was so long. Like we left the signing that the talk 10 minutes early to get in line and the line was already long. And then it, it we waited for almost an hour. And then they told us TJ has to leave at 530. And we look at our phones and it's 525. And we're not even close to the front of the line. So at that point, we just gave up and we said, okay, well, we've got other books signed by TJ. It's fine. We'll just we'll just go. And I got this signed by Isabel Cañas, Vampires of El Norte, because there were people there who wanted TJ, Isabel, and Tracy. So they were going through along the line and pulling people out saying, hey, you know, Isabel only, Tracy only, you can bump to the front. So we bumped to the front and then we left and walked home. <laughs> and now I'm home. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I'm excited to read this. She was really fun to listen to. She and TJ really, like, they had a good... They had a good banter. But yeah, so she signed it in silver. She was really cute. I liked her. I'm very excited. I liked the Hacienda when I read it. <clears throat> hi, Pippin. Say hi. Hey. I'm doing something. I'm doing something. Can you be good? Can you be good? Can you get the camera? No? I miss you. Got this sign. So that's today. I did buy two more books for tomorrow. No, three more. Sorry. But I will show you those tomorrow after I have them signed. Pippin's jumping at something on the window. And he's just going boop, boop. Tired. I'm going to go um, drink lots of water and maybe then make some tea because my throat hurts and change into my clothes that are not sweaty and gross and stinky. I'm just going to clean up and then I'm going to, you know, just, just veg. <laughs> so tired. I always forget every year how tired this makes me. Okay, day one down. See you tomorrow. Their history and their stories and their family history are, is through the oral tradition. And so you have tales of like La Llorona, La Lechusa, all of these really rich um, histories that, you know, they were not able to tell, even, you know, the story about Santa Muerte, yeah. and here we are, and that's why I also wrote this, because all of my books, really, the Queen of Cicadas, uh, Goddess of Filth, they all touch on these deities, these spirits, these beings, these ideas that uh, belong to the indigenous people of Mexico, that uh, Aztec history, and then more recently, my family history in Texas and South Texas urban legend. Um, and I love that. I love playing with urban legends uh, because, you know, horror is huge. There's so many subgenres. Uh, but there's those tropes that we all know and love, like uh, vampires, ghosts. Cryptids. How about told from a different perspective? I love Dracula. You know, I live in England. Uh, I've gone to visit his urn in Golders Green. Um, but I wanted to. What, what are non-white vampires like? What is their lore? Where is their history? <laughs> exactly. Um, and I love this because I have a vampire book coming out in April. Because I'm upset. It's gonna be good. Right? <laughs> but it's about. La Maliche, Malinali, who is a, a, a historical figure. But again, her history, most of it is untold because it was erased and she was branded a traitor. So now is an opportunity for people like us to reclaim our stories, our histories, and to make our mark in literature on tropes that we've been mostly locked out of. because my PhD was um, about a particular tale, um, kind of a story of like King Arthur and his knights that was told in uh, medieval Turkey. And it was passed um, from storyteller to storyteller and performed in public and in private. And it was finally put down on paper in the 1360s and that's what I wrote about. It. And so I did a lot of like thinky thinky academic writing about this, um, writing my dissertation at the same time as I was writing this book. And what happened was they began to bleed into each other. Even though, like, I, I write what I write, um, 
in terms of fiction. So it's like I did I did it to get away from my academic life, and it, it, it followed me in anyway. Um, and I think that was because around the same time, my mother-in-law went on a family history bender. And her family is uh, Welsh and Scottish, and she had uh, a dizzying array of documents going back to like the 18th century. I was able to point, um, like, show my husband like something where, like, oh look, this is a, a marriage certificate. You know, it's like from Edinburgh from like 1806, and these are your family, blah 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 blah. blah. My husband's like, yeah, whatever. She's not a family history person. And she turned and she was compiling like this book about it. And um, she was like, we want to include you and your family stories into this book too. Uh, where's your paperwork, basically? And I kind of had that moment that I described earlier where I just froze. Because my grandfather is from a town in uh, Tamaulipas called Padilla. You might not have heard of it because Padilla is underwater. Um, the government built a dam in the 60s and rerouted a river, and it flooded the town. Now with global warming, the lake that it formed is beginning, the, the, like, the water level is beginning to, to, to drop. And so you can see the military school where obviously the Kurdire was, was, was shot um, in the 19th century. Um, and you're beginning to see like the peaks of the churches like come through and it's like a ghost town. It's all underwater. And that's where my papers are. That's where our documentation is. And I didn't know how to tell my mother-in-law this. Because, you know, my great grandmother saw Pancho Villa right through her village in mm -hmm. Nuevo León, but like, didn't everybody? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I realized that my dissertation was about oral tradition that was set to paper. And I was always asking myself academically, like, okay, there was this one guy who decided to do it. Why did he do it? Why do I do it? Because that's what we have. And I think. It would be lost otherwise if we don't do it. And so it's when you hear those stories, like from your grandmother, from your dad, from other family members, uh, that's precious currency. That is um, our DNA. It's what makes us who we are. It's what validates us in a world that wants us erased. And it's all I can do to put it to paper. And so part of the, I'd say, the structural underpinning of this work is the fact that my family is from this region. Did they fight vampires? I would like to think so. <laughs> but what they did do is they told stories to each other, narrating the experience of what it was like to suddenly be citizens of a country that they didn't want to be a part of, and what that meant, and what it meant to be educated in a system that wanted to see them flattened and, and whitened and erased and made something that they were not. And so, it's really important to me to finally put these stories to paper because I listened to my grandmother at the kitchen table so many times. What I tried to do and what I did in the book, if you see the book, like to me, you're telling somebody a story, it's you and them. You're telling the story, I'm not telling you the problem, I'm telling you the story, but I'm not in the room with you, but I'm writing. Right so how do I get to how do I get to that pause without saying pause, right? All of that stuff is just gets in the way of telling the story. So the only real tools that we have as a writer is what we put on the page. So I'm like, I've got I've got breaks in there, I've got somebody who's like, it's like, I don't even know the comments like it's like that else is stunting in his books. So there are like breaks, there, there's you know, no um, quotation marks or just whatever. It's, it has to look a certain way on the page. And when you read it, you get the rhythm, you get the breath. And some people like, sometimes it takes like a minute, but once I do it, like, holy shit, it's like, you're in there telling me a story. And I'm like, yes. Because that's what I want to do. I want to tell that story in a way that brings us really close like not paint your face close telling you the story, but we're in the same room chilling, having coffee or whatever. And I'm telling you this story. And so to do that, that sort of take that morality and make it mechanically translate to the page. Like, to me, that's like something that's really important to do. I think I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm 
Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Do you want to tell me about your favorite moments of the festival so far? Yeah, I have two. Um, the first one is like seeing TJ Kloon like everywhere, <laughs> both days. And then my favorite panel was with Angie Kim. At Ye uh, no, <laughs> Jean Kwok and Nancy uh, Yujin Kim. Nancy Kim wrote Happiness Falls, and it was just a really wonderful panel with really smart, fun women. They were all funny, and it was touching, and a lot of fun. Cool. What are your favorite tropes to write versus read? For me, I like uh, forced proximity and marriages of convenience. Yeah. Yeah. Marriage of convenience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I just take a survey? Am I the only person who likes H gap? No, I don't. Which gap? Which gap? Doesn't matter. H gap. Okay, so seven. Okay. Yes. You're gonna buy the next one. Okay, that's seven. <laughs> juicy digging into their emotions and what kept them apart and what happened in the interim. So I really enjoy that. And I really enjoy reading the wallflower and the rake trope. Oh, yeah. um, because there's just that moment where the rake falls, you know, head over heels. And I just, I live for that. <laughs> Especially if he's like, like really like devil in the winter where he's like a real sarcastic and yes. she like plays him. I love it. <laughs> um, I my favorite tropes both to read and write are um, estranged marriage and fake dating. Uh, I love reading a marriage of convenience at any time. Uh, I like to write, which I don't know if this is technically a trope, but anyone who's terrified. Of being in love. Yeah. Anyone yeah, who yeah. finds it terrifying yeah. and excruciating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have my stuff and we can pass it? Oh, oh, sure, sure. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the same bed. Because yeah. I work out my unresolved <laughs> adolescent. <laughs> 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 For a, a trope I love to read but don't like to write is like fake dating and marriage of convenience world. So fun to read, I just don't think I have ideas for it. Um, and I really, I also really love writing only one bed. Um, but I really like uh, kind of right person, right time later, you know, but not like true second chance. Somebody in the audience asked, what's a trope? Oh, explain it. Not me. Somebody. <laughs> 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 a trope is going to be kind of a micro theme within, um, a, especially in a romance novel. Like a plot device. You <laughs> 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 all the tropes. <laughs> um, I haven't written it yet, but I would love to write fake dating because just like. You know when you're dating somebody and <clears throat> all your friends make you kiss in front of them so that you prove that you're really dating them? Like, that happens yeah. to everyone. All and the time. Just the moment. And then it's real, it feels real. Uh, yeah, it's happening to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hate amnesia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate amnesia. I hate secret babies until so told me, somebody told me that Mr. Rebbe wrote a secret baby. I'm like, no, we didn't. And they said, yes, you did. <laughs> yes, please surrender. Uh, yeah. That's a secret baby. But if she didn't know who the dad was, so it's not a secret baby. <laughs> Two 
two different shades of color. One is black and bi biracial, black and like green, biracial. There's a, a monoracial black man and an Irish immigrant. Um, and to me, I wrote like that because that's what my actual friend groups are like. Um, and keeping all those identities in mind, like I try to talk to people in my life who have identities that I don't share so that I can try to like, do my best, I try to do research. Um, but to be honest, like if you are consuming the most diverse media you can and you're living in a like big city where you have access to people, like it should just kind of be something that can come as a reflection, but still you should think about it and talk to somebody and, and all of that. Um, and you also like, what uh, Vanessa was saying, not everybody wants you to do that. Like I have had people tag me and things saying like, it was trying too hard to be diverse. So also just mentally preparing yourself for some people to say pretty wild stuff in response to that um, is just as important as like the craft itself. Yeah, I should. I just want to say it's, just, it's not hard to create a diverse cast of side characters. Like as a white person, I only feel comfortable writing from the perspective of white people. But uh, when it comes to side characters, like whenever I read a book where there's literally no people of color or no queer people, like that person's just being lazy and not reflecting the real world, like you said, Rachel. Like it shouldn't be hard to reflect the real world in your side characters. Like right now, when a publishing wants to buy romanticy and that's by white people, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and. Um, so, but, I, but yeah, going back to what I think Rachel said, it shouldn't affect your actual process because things change so much. I think we're all different. Yeah. You know, for some people it's the plot, some people it's the trope, some people it's, you know, so because we all write differently. You know, we all don't write the same way. So if you're an aspiring writer, do you? You know, don't look to anybody else's example. You write what, what, what floats your own, okay? And it can Perfect. depend on the book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to jump in if I can just to say, like, I was so excited to do this panel um, with all of these amazing people. And I think oftentimes people kept saying, like, it's going to be happy. It's going to be an upbeat kind of thing. And this is pretty serious. <laughs> <laughs> but I so respect it and I'm so grateful for that because it's like you guys are bringing these really important questions. And just because it's romance doesn't mean it has to live in a world of unicorns and glitter, which is good for book covers especially, but you know, <laughs> I just want to say like, thank you for being willing to get into it with yeah. us. Just yeah. speaking for yeah. you. Yeah. ghost talking to you it's very possible i feel like being quiet right now because everything has been very loud all day i learned something about myself also today i learned that i don't like irish dancing i don't like it i don't like that the top halves of their bodies don't move and like the ones that don't smile while the top half of their bodies aren't moving and then the, the underneath is doing this i don't like it Real quick, before I go unstinkify and uh, make some mac and cheese and get in my comfy cozies and uh, do whatever else I'm gonna do tonight, because who knows, my routine's all t I wanna show you the books I got signed and also the books that I bought today. I already owned these three and I just brought them with me today. So the first one is Love in the Time of Serial Killers by Alicia Thompson, and then I got with Love from Cold World by Alicia Thompson. So I got her to sign both of these. She was awesome. Uh, she complimented my fake tattoo and I told her it was fake and she was wearing a Ninja Turtles sweatshirt. And Lindsay, Lindsay, my friend Lindsay had told her, she, well, I like your sweatshirt. And then she goes, it's real. <laughs> so she's very funny and weird. Um, also, this has a 3.3 on Goodreads. I, I didn't, I never went back and checked after I read the arc. I love this book and other people don't, okay.
maybe it's just because she's weird so who knows but she wrote in this one i've gotten louder now ashley do not go to a second location xoxo and then she drew me a kitty cat and then in with love wait with love from cold world she wrote i haven't read this one yet ashley hope this warms your heart and then she drew me a little snowman i've been in this is my outside all day hair and then I wasn't, it was I couldn't go to any of her panels. It just didn't work out. But I did bring my Inkblood Sister Scribe just in case. I like found a way to get it signed. I like didn't think that I would. Cameo from Pippin. But uh, TJ Kloon, Yang Shi Chu, and Emma Torres were all signing together in a booth outside. And TJ Kloon's line was like three, almost three hours long. And he just, he, like a champ, my friend Lindsay kept texting me. He's still signing. He's still signing. <laughs> Poor guy. Anyway. She was there and she had to leave early and I literally just caught her right, like, my friend Jesse was like, well, Emma Tours is there, you write your book, let's go. So we went and I got it signed. But she was like leaving to go to another panel. So that is signed. So these are the three I already owned. And then I did buy some books today. First, I bought three of these yesterday, but didn't show them to you because I'm getting them signed today and I wanted to wait till they were signed. So the first one is How You Get the Girl by Anita Kelly. They were very nice. They took a picture with me and I don't know, I might upload it here, but I don't like, well, I look like a goober in it. So um, I don't think that I will post it, but whatever, we'll see. And then they signed it for Ashley Bobcats Forever. I accidentally just started reading this, by the way, when I was in, waiting in the Whole Foods parking lot to pick up my groceries. And I was just like, I'm just going to look at all my books and my signatures. And then I read the first sentence and then, oops, I read three pages, four pages. <laughs> so I've started this book now. And then let's see, yesterday I also bought, now the queen, Beverly Jenkins, was at the festival. She's a romance uh, author. She's been writing for decades. She's very well known within Romance Landia, if you are unaware She's a very prominent black author as well. So she's like every romance author there, it was hilarious, was like deferring to her. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I have some stories, I won't put them here unless people want to hear them. <laughs> she was hilarious, but she was very like used to being treated well. You know what I mean? Like we lost her. I, I, I'm not going to talk about it. But anyway, I need. I wanted to get a book signed. She was supposed to come to the festival two years ago and I read Indigo and brought it with me and then she couldn't come. So I think she was sick, but she came this year. Didn't want to buy one of her like straight up romance novels, but then I heard about this book from KJ Charles of all people, and it's about a 52 year old black woman starting over after her husband is a shit heel. And that's the first. I guess this is a whole series. It's called Bring On the Blessings. So I got her. To, actually, I didn't. I saw her signing books at the Steamy Lit Tent, which is a romance bookstore, and so I just like popped in while she was doing that, and she signed it for me. But Anyway, I, I will post, you will have just seen the clip of her. <laughs> I'm sure I, she said she was the best thing on the panel Every, and everyone else was like loving her too. So um, anyway, I think that I got some good clips, clips of her talking, but she was great. And then yesterday I bought The Fox Wife, which I talked about in my February wrap up because I loved it and it's only getting better in my mind and I do want to reread it. And Yang Shi Tu is the most adorable human. Like, I literally ran into her this morning. Like, I accidentally almost knocked her over. <laughs> so, oops. I didn't get to see any of her panels, and I'm really upset about it. And my friends did, and they said she was awesome and really good. And I'm really upset. But she did draw me a kitty cat. So, I got a kitty cat, and it says, For Ashley, best wishes and happy reading. I guess she was drawing foxes, but she told my friends that she's not good at drawing foxes, so she draws more cats than foxes. <laughs> and then the books I bought today from the panels I went to, this morning I went to a panel with some authors that really weren't very well connected to each other, but one of them was Jennifer Croft, who is the translator for Olga Tokarczyk, who sh she didn't translate Drive Your Bones Over the... Wait, sorry. Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. She didn't translate that one, but she did translate two of her others. I guess it's pretty well known that one of the books that she translated, The Books of Jacob, is responsible like for pushing the Nobel Prize Committee over the edge and what's got Olga Tokarczyk, the, the Nobel Prize. But anyway, she was awesome. She was the best part. I'm so glad that I got to see her speak. But anyway, she wrote a book called The Extinction of Irene or Way, and I'm not going to even try to explain this to you guys right now, but it sounds so weird. 
and I'm actually really excited about reading it. It's about translators getting lost in a forest <laughs> or something. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm excited about it. And then the last book that I bought is Never Whistle at Night. I didn't realize when I picked this panel, I picked it because V. Castro and Isabel Cañas were on the panel, but I didn't realize that the other people, Peter Von, Von Alst Jr., goes by Ted, and Shane Hawk were the editors of this collection, which I want to read. So as soon as I realized they were there, I was like, oh, I'm buying that. And then they didn't have any books for sale near the signing. So I didn't get it signed, but I did manage to get a copy before I left for the day. So I'm, I'm at least glad that I have it, but I wish I could have got them to sign it because they were cool. Anyway, so those are my books. I have a stack over there. I'm too tired to get up right now and go get it and show you everything that I got over the weekend, but I bought 13 books. <laughs> so that's it. That's all my book. Oh, wait, sorry. I bought 14 books because I wanted to buy, after listening to Jennifer Croft speak, I wanted to buy an Olga Tokarczyk book. And I didn't end up choosing one that she'd translated just because it didn't sound the most interesting to me. I ended up choosing one that Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead because it's like a mystery book. And that sounds interesting to me because I love mystery. But I couldn't find it. They didn't have it in any used bookstore tent. They didn't have it at the sales tent, obviously, because the person who translated that book wasn't there. <laughs> and they didn't, I just couldn't find it. So I, I was out on campus at the festival and I pulled up Pango books and I bought it. <laughs> so, and Jesse was like, you're here, you bought it at the festival. So I bought a 14th book. <laughs> I forgot about that. Okay. So anyway, that, that has been the 2024 Tucson Festival of Books. I hope this video was interesting. I think I got some good footage from the authors, but I, I really, just like happened last year, I got very distracted by everything that was going on. I didn't even film, oh, there's Lily. I didn't even film the three-legged Gila monster that Jesse and I met. Her name was Peggy. We saw a rattlesnake. I ate tacos. I ate Indian food. I told you about the Irish dancers, nightmare fuel. Uh, there's just, there was just tons of stuff going on. Lindsay stalked TJ Klune a little bit on accident. I stalked him for a little bit of that. <laughs> like he was in the bookstore. He walked out and we walked out at the same time. And we were like following each other down the UA mall. Um, and I branched off to go get Indian food. And then Lindsay was texting me. She's like, I'm still following him. I'm still following him. So anyway, um, yeah, so that was it. Um, I'm, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I'm not exercising for like at least three days after this. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna go have some mac and cheese. Another year down. If you like this video, please give me a like, subscribe if you wanna. And then if you made it this far and you don't have anything to say about anything that I'm about, that I just showed you, which I don't even know yet because <laughs> I forgot what I filmed, then you can leave me a book stack because of the Tucson Festival of Books. Maybe a book stack and a tent. There were lots of tents that I spent some time in this weekend. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your week because you will be, you will be seeing this in the week, not in the weekend. Okay, love you, bye.